Hi everyone, it's the Math Sorcerer here. In this video, we're going to discuss the second derivative test. Here you see the second derivative test. It says, suppose that f prime of x naught is equal to zero. And there's two conditions. So the first saying, if the second derivative is positive at x naught, then f of x naught is a local minimum. This is also called a relative minimum. Second condition says, if the second derivative at x naught is less than zero, then f of x naught is a local maximum. This is also called a relative maximum. Let's briefly try to make sense of these statements over here on the left. So our first derivative is equal to zero. That basically means that we have a horizontal tangent line at zero. And for condition one to be true, the concavity must be positive because the second derivative is positive at a number when the function is concave up at that number. So putting those two together, the graph should look roughly like this, and this is x naught, and so you see you have a local minimum. The second condition says that the second derivative is negative, that would imply concave down, and then the fact that the first derivative is zero at x naught would imply that perhaps the graph might have this behavior at least locally close to x naught. And it's pretty easy to memorize, you can just think of it as being backwards, so it's positive, so you have a min, it's negative, so you have a max. Let's go ahead and do some examples. Find all local maxima and minima for f of x equals 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 12x minus 1. Let's go ahead and work through its solution. We'll start by trying to use the second derivative test. So we'll take the derivative and set it equal to 0. So we have f prime of x. And so taking the derivative here, we can use the power rule. So you bring down the 3. 3 times 2 is 6. And you subtract 1 from the exponent, so you get 6x squared. Same thing here, 2 times 3 is 6. Subtract 1 from the exponent, you get x to the first power. And the derivative of minus 12x is just minus 12, because the derivative of x is 1, and then the derivative of minus 1 is 0, so it goes away. We set this equal to 0. We have f prime of x is equal to, we should be able to factor this, maybe, Maybe we can pull out a six here. So this is six parentheses. And let's see, six times what is six x squared? So x squared. And then six times what is six x? It's gonna be x. And then six times what is gonna give us minus 12, so minus two. This is equal to zero. This should factor, let's see, this is six, parentheses, 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 parentheses. I'll put an x here and an x here. So x times x is x squared. We need two numbers that multiply to negative two, but add to one. So two and minus one should do it. And then this is equal to zero. Whenever you have a product equal to zero, you set each factor equal to zero. You can just divide away by the six, so I'll leave it there. And we get x equals negative two. And then we also get x equals one. These are the x values where the derivative is zero. So that's our x naught from our second derivative test. Recall the first condition was that we had f prime of x naught equal to zero. So these are our values for x naught. Now we have to take these values that we have and plug them into the second derivative and check to see if it's positive or if it's negative. If the result is positive, we have a min. If the result is negative, we have a max. All right, so our second derivative is going to be f double prime of x. So here's our first derivative, 6x squared plus 6x minus 12. So differentiating again, 2 times 6 is 12. And we subtract 1 from the exponent, so we just get x. And then the derivative of 6x is simply 6. And the derivative of minus 12 is 0, so it goes away. So here's our second derivative. And now we're going to go ahead and check. Let's check each one. Let's do it over here. Let's check negative two. So f double prime of negative two. This is equal to, so putting in the negative two for the x into the second derivative, this is 12 times negative two plus six. Hmm, that's negative 24 plus six, so that's negative 18. And that's less than zero. Right? That's less than zero. So that means we have, so we have a, maximum let me just say relative so we have a relative maximum or local maximum so we have a local 
max at the x value of negative 2. So because the second derivative is negative at negative 2, we have a local maximum at x equals negative 2. To actually find the local maximum, what you do is you take the negative 2 and you plug it back into the original function. Let's go ahead and do that. So f of negative 2 is equal to so putting a negative 2 everywhere you see an x for f of x. It's 2 times negative 2 cubed plus 3 times negative 2 squared minus 12 times negative 2 and then minus 1. And if you work this out, you should get 19. And so that's going to be our maximum. It's a relative maximum or a local maximum. All right, now we just have to check one. So let's go ahead and do that. So f double prime of one, this is going to be, so plugging it in here, it'll be 12 times one plus six. That's 18. So that is positive. So in this case, we have a min. So we have, we have a min or a local min, let's be more specific, at x equals 1. And again, to actually find the value of the min, um, we just take the 1 and we plug it back into the function. I'll do it over here on the left. So f of 1 is equal to 2 times 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 squared minus 12 times 1 minus 1. So f of 1 going to be, let's see, 2 plus 3 is 5, and then we have minus 13. It's going to be equal to minus 8, and so that is going to be our local min. Very nice. In this example, we had one um, local min, and we have one local max. Let's go ahead and do another example where things might not be so simple. Find all extrema for f of x equals x to the fourth plus 4x four cubed plus 6x squared plus 4x plus 1. Go ahead and work through this one solution. Problem is really interesting because f of x can be written in a really nice way. We can write f of x as follows. It's equal to parentheses x plus 1. And the whole thing here is being raised to the fourth power. So let me show you how I know that. So there's something called Pascal's triangle. And to draw the triangle, you start by putting a 1 here. And then you put 1s on the sides. So 1 and 1. And then you add 1 plus 1 is 2. And then you put 1s in the sides. And then you add 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 1 is 3. And then you put 1s in the sides. And then you add 1 plus 3 is 4. 3 plus 3 is 6. 3 plus 1 is 4. And then you put 1s in the sides. And I'm going to stop here. So basically, this is row 0. Start counting at row 0. This one here is row 1. This one here is row 2. This one here is row 3. This one here is row 4. And this tells you how to expand x plus y. So if, if you had x plus y to the fourth power, you would look at the coefficient here. So it's a 1. So it's 1 times x to the fourth, y to the 0. Okay, and you start at 4 because there's a 4 here, and then you start the y at 0. And you put a plus sign, and you go to the next one. So it's 4, that's your coefficient. You see, these are the coefficients. And then you subtract 1 from your exponent here, so it's 3. Then you add 1 to your exponent of 0, so it's 1. Then you go to the next one, 6. Then you subtract 1 from the exponent on the x, so it's x squared. And you add 1 to the exponent on the y, so it's y squared. Plus, go to the next one, 4. So hopefully you're starting to see the pattern now. Subtract one from the x, add one to the y. And the last one is one, and it'll be x to the zero. Oh, it's so small, <laughs> y to the fourth, running off the screen. So I guess I can move it over a little bit so you can see there, there we go. There we go, a little bit better there. So yeah, interesting, interesting. Whoops, 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 let's see if, there we go. There we go, now you can see it better. Okay, so that is the expansion of x plus y to the fourth. So this is equal to x to the fourth 
plus 4x cubed y plus 6x squared y squared plus 4xy cubed. Very powerful stuff. Plus y to the fourth. So you can expand x plus y to any integral power using this beautiful triangle. Obviously, the bigger n is, here in this case, n is 4, um, the longer it gets. So in our particular example, it's simply x plus 1. So look at the coefficients. It's 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. That's what we have here. 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. So you, I just looked at it and knew it would fit this form. Let's go back to our problem now. So now that we've established that we can write this function in a beautiful way, x plus 1 to the fourth, let's try to use the second derivative test. So f prime of x is equal to, well, this is going to be a chain rule because you have an inside function, which is x plus 1. We bring down the 4, differentiating the outside, leaving the inside untouched. And then you subtract 1 from the exponent, 4 minus 1 is 3, times the derivative of the inside function, which is just 1. And so this is equal to 0. So f prime of x, I'm going to write it one more time, is going to be 4 x plus 1 the third power, and this is equal to 0. This is obviously going to give us an answer of x equals negative 1. So now let's check. Let's take the derivative again. So f double prime of x. So 3 times 4 is 12. In parentheses, x plus 1 squared. And times 1, but I won't write it because it doesn't matter. And now if you plug in negative 1 here, something terrible happens. You get 12. Negative 1 plus 1. Oh no! We're going to get 12 times 0, right? Which is 0, which is not good, right? So we can't use the second derivative test. So many people would say the second derivative test fails at this point. So what do you do other than go up? Well, you can actually just use uh, the definition of maximums and minimums. So just notice that if you plug in negative 1 here into your function, f of negative 1, you're going to get 0. And that's the smallest it can be because this quantity, x plus 1 to the fourth, is always positive unless x is negative 1. So you could say something like f of x is greater than or equal to f of negative 1 or all x. Right? Because it's going to be greater than or equal to 0 for all x. So that means that 0 is actually a minimum. So 0 is, and it's not just a local minimum, it's absolute because it's happening for all x. So 0 is the absolute minimum in this case. And that's because of what I've written here, because f of x is greater than or equal to f of negative 1 for all x. By the way, f of negative 1 is 0. So greater than or equal to 0 for all x, so 0 is the absolute minimum. So kind of an interesting problem because um, a lot of people rely on the second derivative test, and it's okay to do that. It's just when it fails, and when you have a situation where the second derivative is 0 at that number you're supposed to test, then you have to take a different approach. And in this particular example, this is the approach we took. You could have taken another approach. You could have looked at the first derivative, and you could have checked the sign by using a sign diagram, and you could have arrived at the same answer, and you would have deduced that it is a local minimum at that case. But to really establish that it's an absolute minimum, I think this is the way to go. Hopefully you've learned some mathematics in this video. If you have, make sure to check out more videos. And until next time, good luck and take care.